again. I'm just excited to be here. Yes, thank you, Billy. Um, I also want to point out that um, we have Robbie, who is our ASL interpreter. Um, so if you need to pin her, please make sure you pin her um, to your screen. Thank you. Let me go next, please. All right, y'all. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to introduce Candice, and then Billy will introduce Tamika, and then Candice will go ahead um, and present today. So. Candace has lived through more than most would even imagine. Born and raised throughout Los Angeles and its surrounding areas, she grew up with an unparalleled drive and determination. Being diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy at the age of 18 months, she knew that her life would be challenging, but she never let that stop her from achieving her goals and living her life on her terms. Upon graduating from high school, Candace moved out and into the world on her own. She enrolled at Santa Monica College to study journalism, joined an externship program with the Los Angeles Times. Fueled by her desire to earn a higher level degree, she transferred to Cal State University Northridge woo -woo, and went on to receive her BA in journalism with an emphasis in public relations and minor in psychology, as well as earning her master's in public administration. Candace began her career in entertainment publicity, where she was offered an executive assistant role with Issa Rae Productions, where she had a hand in coordinating Issa Rae's many business ventures and projects and became an integral part of the team. She currently works at the Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority where she continues to create and implement several organization-wide equitable initiatives, plans and facilitates monthly cultural diverse events, and is continuing her professional development in diversity, equity, and inclusion spaces. Please help me welcome Candice. Thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. And then Billy will introduce um, Tamika. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, impressive, yeah. <laughs> I have um, some huge uh, people to follow now. Um, Tamika Lewis is a clinical director and founder of Women of Color Therapy, a mental health and wellness community for teens and women in color, of color in Los Angeles. She is trained in cognitive behavioral therapy, the grief recovery method, the eye movement, desensitization and recompressing, also known as EMDR, Tamika draws from over 15 years of experience working with organizations such as UCLA Medical Center, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, and LAUSD. She graduated from Cal State, Cal, excuse me, California State University, Long Beach, with a master's degree in school counseling and completed her master's in social work at UCLA. Tamika has been featured in the Washington Post, The, the Lilies. Um, LA Times, Shondaland, Thrive Global, and Prevention Magazine. She loves to travel and has two amazing kids and is working on her second book, Tiny Moves, The Defining Moments That Changes. Ah, welcome, Tamika. Thank you for having me. All right, y'all. So um, we're going to go ahead and Candice is going to start off the event and um, tell us her story. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so a little bit about my story. Um, as Carla mentioned, I was born with a rare disability called spinal muscular atrophy at the tender age of 18 months. And I have been just kicking butt since then, <laughs> to say it nicely. Um, first and foremost, I definitely identify as a Black educated woman wheelchair user. I see myself as a disability advocate, world traveler. I love to travel. You can always catch me on a flight somewhere trying to explore a new culture. And I have now pivoted from entertainment to um, DEI. And I love the work. I feel like it is truly my purpose on this earth to produce this great work about diversity, equity, and more importantly, inclusion and accessibility. And that is where my passion thrives and um, I come alive. So yeah, I definitely um, am really inspired um, in the DEI space.
Is there anything else you want to add on, um, Candice? Um, yeah, I can definitely say, um, I definitely, typically, you know, with my educational and career journey, I definitely did not have a smooth landing. Um, I kind of went all over the place, to be honest. After graduating high school, I enrolled in fashion school. I, you know, realized that was not Your speaker is not working. Please check your connection or use different speaker. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I think she connection in chat. Connection chica. And I think I'm sorry. Someone is not muted. Excuse me. Sorry. No problem. Sorry. Yeah, so um, I definitely oh, kind of went all over fashion. the place. Started in fashion oh, school and realized that that was not where. Should I continue? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, no worries. I realized that was not where I really wanted to be. And I knew I had a gift for writing. So I decided to pursue that and went headfirst into Santa Monica College, pursued journalism. I mean, I went up and moved up from volunteer to staff writer to sports editor to editor in chief. That's where I started to really see, I wanted to see how far I could go. And I pursued an externship with Los Angeles Times. And that was a pretty pivotal change for me because I think at that point I was trying to decide, do I wanna pursue news writing or do I wanna pursue something a little bit more creative? And when I decided I wanted to pursue something more creative, I still stayed within journalism, but um, I pivoted to like public relations. And that's when I started my journey at CSUN. And I went headfirst into public relations, which is what led me into the entertainment industry. And I did that for about, I'd say 10 to 15 years, pretty much all my twenties to mid thirties, I was in the entertainment world, um, working red carpets, handling press junkets, um, working with clients, um, TV premieres, movie premieres. Um, and that led me to meet the amazing Issa Rae. And I was able to pretty much learn from one of our greatest writers, producers, directors, her work ethic just kind of translated over to me and really inspired me. Um, and I was able to meet so many amazing people and just be surrounded by such great black excellence. And just to see that every day was just amazing for me. Um, and then from there, while I was still working with Issa, I realized uh, the entertainment industry is fun, but I really wanna get to something a little bit more stable, not so many long hours. Um, so I pivoted to government. <laughs> And I say, I, I say all this because while you're in college and you're trying to discover what you want to do, there's a lot of pivots and people will say, oh, you need to focus on one thing. No, you can pivot because pivoting shows you what you're good at, where you want to go, where you want to pursue and what you don't want to pursue. So in my final pivot to government, um, I kind of found my lane. And I kind of removed myself from entertainment. Like I said, I wanted more of a stability and I wanted to really be able to advocate. As a disabled black woman, I really wanted to advocate for my community. And working within the government, I found my purpose through DEI work. I was inspired just by the sheer ability of having lived experience and being able to share that with the world and really advocate for my community. People with disabilities are generally seen as a second-class citizen in the world or even less not thought of at all. And so I really wanted to highlight how amazing we are, how amazing this community is, how thriving this community is. And I wanted to show there's value and there's respect that needs to be commanded for that community. 
I wasn't going to be a model. I wasn't going to be an actress, but I definitely wanted to be the representation that was not there for me when I was a kid. When I was looking in on a TV or looking and going to office buildings and I didn't see anyone in a wheelchair. So I wanted to be that change. And so DEI for me means being the representation that I, that I did not see and advocating for each and every person that comes after me that, that what they wanna do to live independently, work, travel, be happy. It's all, they're all, it's all viable. You just have to really, really work hard at pursuing it because in this country, disability is a taboo word. We try to ignore it, we try to hide it. But I definitely feel like I'm here to say, no, you're not gonna hide me. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna make myself be known so that the next person that comes through those doors, we know how to hear them, see them, and respect them. Thank you, Candice. I'm wondering um, how you continue to set boundaries at work or dealing and dealing with work and life balance. Be honest, um, I am not good at um, work-life balance. I mean, everyone likes to say, "Oh yeah, I have a good work-life balance." I'm not about to lie to y'all. I don't. <laughs> um, I work a lot. I don't take a lot of time off for myself. But I am learning that it's not healthy. So I do try to implement small changes, like just. A year ago, I literally would work till one and two o'clock in the morning in my bed on my computer. And there are times when that is necessary, but not every day, not seven days a week. You don't need to do that. So one step that I decided to make for a boundary is work will be work. And when I lay down to rest, that is rest because working in DEI, it's a very emotional job. It, it can be very taxing at times. And even as an advocate, you connect to people, you connect to their stories. So sometimes you need to have a shut off and that's okay. And I'm currently learning that that's okay. So that's one way that I create a boundary. Um, another boundary I would say that has worked semi-well for me is um, travel. As I mentioned earlier, I love to travel. so one way to get my mind to kind of decompress and escape is let me let me plan my next trip where do i want to go because I, everyone needs a break and you should honor that and have fun with it so that's a boundary that i like to take um it's part of my self-care travel is my self-care candace do you have any advice for um any students or staff who are watching who, um, excuse my daughter, she, I'm sorry, who um, are dealing with a disability? Yes, um, I definitely would say, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it for you. Um, if you are a person that has a disability or has limited mobility, whether it's visible or invisible, no one is going to hold your hand and walk you through the stages and steps of life because everyone is life and out here. So I think what I like to tell people in the disabled community is if you're going to step out in the world, be prepared for the world. Because for me, especially working in the entertainment industry, they did not care if I was in pain last night they didn't care if you know my transportation or the bus didn't come on time they don't care about that they want the job done and so I had to work harder than most I had to be in early stay late I couldn't have an excuse there was no excuses because physically they already thought that I was incapable of the job so I had to show and prove no, I can do this and watch out because I might do it better than you. So definitely be prepared. 
be prepared to work. No one said it's going to be easy. Life is hard for everyone. And yes, there are ways that you can adjust to make it a little bit easier for yourself in certain moments, but life is hard. So be prepared. No one's going to hold your hand. But also when you see people out in the world with disabilities, have compassion. You don't have to be rude. You don't have to be, you don't have to ignore them. They're not some alien figure. You know, we are human beings as well. So respect us as well. Thank you so much for that. Um, are you seeing more um, representation in the in entertainment industry? Yes, for sure. I mean, some of my good friends are actresses on TV shows. Um, I'm seeing them in commercials. I mean, I get super excited when I see a Target ad with someone that is in a wheelchair. I'm like, yo, that is awesome. Because when I was a little girl, I did not see that. When I was a little girl, I didn't see, you know, wheelchair Halloween costumes. That was not a thing. And now with social media and more awareness, people are, you know, representing and coming out in full color and showing their true authentic selves. So I definitely see that. But I think to speak to policy and procedure and when you're working in the government and DEI, I think there's a lot of room to grow because the word in itself, diversity, equity, and inclusion, can we have any of that if, if accessibility is not there? I always say I identify as a Black woman, but the world sees me as a disabled person first. They don't even see me as a woman, just a disabled person. So if I can't get into the, the front door of the building that I need to go to for a meeting or a job interview or a conference, that's where it ends for me because accessibility is not there. So for me, DEI does not mean anything without accessibility. If we can't have full accessibility for everyone, are we really inclusive? That part, uh, representation does matter. And I feel like social media has been like um, spearheading that, like you see Barbie dolls now um, with, who represent and that's just great. Um, Even my best friends got me the first wheelchair Barbie doll and I have it still in the package. I wanna pass it down to my kids later. Like that was huge. I never had a Barbie doll that looked like me. Yeah. Not to bring a tear to my eye, representation <laughs> through and through. Um, I personally want to know who your hero is, um, especially growing up with a disability, um, who's someone you looked up to. I'm going to keep it 100. I didn't have a hero as a kid. Um, not someone that I looked up to, not in that way. I think I became my own hero every day getting up, de deciding not to be the stereotype, not to give the world something else to say negative about the people with disabilities. Every day I get up and I go to work, that, that's me being my own hero. I, I am embodying what I want to see in the future and currently. So, um, I mean, not to sound like a narcissist, but yeah, I'm my own hero because I didn't see anyone that looked like me, that worked like me. And I'm telling you, I, I worked hard to make sure that I could provide for myself. And um, yeah, I'm my own hero. And that's what I'm talking about, okay? I feel that I think I wrote a paper for my um, African American studies class saying I'm my own hero too. Um, just um, focusing on the aspect of Black women and women Women's History Month. Um, do you feel like because you were a Black woman, or because excuse me, you are a Black woman, um, you weren't able to like kind of use your disability as a crutch, like you had to do what you had to do, whether you were disabled or not? 
Oh, for sure. Um, let's not forget, I'm a black woman, educated black woman. There was there was no excuse, and I, I definitely felt that. Um, just as a black woman in general, it's hard. We get the least amount of respect. The, we, we're heard less and less every single day. And I feel like as a black woman, our power is within our strength. Like every day we get up and we make it happen. And so that was my motto, whether it was entertainment, whether it was school, whether it was my current position, I gotta make it happen. There is no, oh, I couldn't figure it out. Nuh uh, what you mean? Because I mean, somebody else tomorrow is gonna take my spot and I ain't doing that. So I have to figure it out today. You want to answer today? I'm going to figure it out today by any means necessary. And there was no room for an excuse. Number one, because I, like you said, I am a black woman and I'm a physically disabled woman. So I already have, according to normal standards, whatever normal is, two, two negatives right there. And also, if you put that I'm sassy, that's three. So I, there was no excuses. I had to make it happen. Thank you so much for being true, truthful with that. Cause I already know just growing up black, like, look, maybe making us, I, I just wanted the audience to know that like, yes, um, this is Women History Month, but we're also closing out Black History Month. And thank you princess in the comments, black women are phenomenal because at the end of the day, I just want to keep it real. We are, um, you know, most likely to be mistreated and this, that, and the other, just as black women in general, we are the, I don't think we're the bottom of the barrel, but society has deemed us the okay. bottom of the barrel. So um, Candace has three strikes, black woman and disabled. Then if you want to add fourth sassy, look, she got a right to be hostile. I'm, let me just keep it real. But do you have any, um, any last things you want to say? And if the audience has any questions, you guys can ask or type it in the chat. I will say that um, whether you're Black woman, woman of any nationality, whatever, whatever it is that you identify as, I will say definitely keep trucking no matter what, because women are beautiful. We are amazing. We bring life. And there is no replacement for that. There is no replacement for that. Like our strength is amazing. And I definitely can say my strength that I like to exude every day is I could give up, but why? Because <laughs> I know that something better is on the other side. A long time ago, somebody told me if you're going through a storm, why would you stop in the middle of the storm? Keep going because on the other side of that storm is something of an amazing blessing that's about to come your way. So I always say I might be in a storm or who knows how long that storm may be. Your storm might be two years, maybe six months, maybe a decade, whatever the case may be, keep pushing. Because at the end of that storm is blessings and, and a beautiful life that is worth living and thriving in. I hear that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Candice. We have questions um, in the chat for you. Um, so Hike asks, um, what do you think we can do as Americans to treat Black women more equitably? Well, first of all, let them talk. <laughs> listen to them, don't interrupt, leave safe spaces, allow for, pe allow for them to be able to come authentically into the room. Oftentimes black women have to sub subdue themselves or you know, conform to whatever work environment they're in. If we're able to come authentically as ourselves, hair and all authentically as us, you're going to get a different woman. You're going to get someone that has amazing ideas that could change 
whatever the situation is, whatever the, the course or trajectory is going, allow them to speak. Thank you. Um, someone direct messaged me this question. Um, did you experience any blockers or people doing illegal actions against you? Oh, for sure. For sure. I have had employers tell me, oh, I probably never would have hired you if I would have known you were in a wheelchair. Or um, I've never, I've never hired anybody in a wheelchair. What do we do with you? What does that look like? Or you know, I can feel when there is, you know, cause I can kill an interview. I can kill it in a meeting, but I can tell when there's like a, oh, so you don't want me here because I look different. But um, that just fuels me because I'm like, oh, okay, no worries. I'm gonna see you again and it'll be at a higher capacity. You're gonna need me to come to you because you're gonna need my expertise. So yeah, I've been blocked since I was a kid. I mean, yeah, block me all up if you want to. I'm gonna break every break down. I know that's right. Um, we have a question in the chat from Ling, I believe. Um, you speak on your love for to travel. What types of pitfalls and experiences have you had traveling as a disabled person? Mm. I will say the travel industry, although I love to travel, is one of the most inequitable industries I have ever experienced. Um, just getting on the plane is dehumanizing. Um, there's no way you can use many of the facilities on the plane because your wheelchair is in the cargo. They're breaking wheelchairs constantly. I mean, it's just dehumanizing on every single level. And I understand why people with disabilities don't want to travel. But for me, I'm going to fight the industry tooth and nail. I'm not going to stop traveling because if we stop traveling, then they've won. They pushed us out. And nah, you ain't about to push me out. I'm going to go to Ghana, I'm going to go to Paris, I'm going to go to Barcelona, I'm going to go to London, I'm going to go everywhere you think I cannot go. And I'm going to make you accountable. Accessibility should not be a question. It should be mandatory. Human, humankind should see that travel is something that should not be, should not be held back because of profit or you want to see it because I've had, had people tell me oh we don't want to put a ramp here because it does it ruins the integrity of the the building well it that that should not be an issue it's it's ruining the integrity for me that I can't enter the building like let's make universal design a thing it we have to make this better and I'm going to keep traveling until it gets better. I'm with you on that. I, it, you know, and as a um, person who's a able body, I don't even notice stuff like that. And now I'm like, you're, I can't even fathom. You're right. I didn't realize that airplanes are not necessarily accessible. Um, and I, people who are, people who have traveled with me, most of my close friends, I feel like they're my my ally, my biggest ally is they champion for me when I'm not even there. They'll call me and be like, girl, I went to a restaurant. They didn't have a ramp. I told them off for you. And I'm like, hey, man, yeah, tell them. Because if I go up there, it's going to be it's going to be bad. Yes, we look, we all need friends like you got. Um, Nusha in the chat asked if they can go with you next time you travel. <laughs> yes, come on, because it's a riot. We going to turn up. I bet you sound like a lot of fun. Um, and Ma Matty, I don't know if I'm um, uh, butchering these names, but I hope not. Wants to thank you for sharing your story. You gave great advice. Um, and I agree. Any last minute questions for Candace before we move on to Ms. Tamika? All right, well, look, Ms. Candace, we enjoyed you. 
Thank you so much for giving up half of your day to us and spending time with us. Um, I know I speak for everyone when we say we really appreciate it. Um, I've never seen this many people turn up for any event. So look, y'all brought the people hey. out. Like, <laughs> here you two. So I just like, I'm, I'm impressed. So you guys are officially celebrities at GCC. Please believe it. Thank you. <laughs> I've never been in this large of a turnout. I'm like, oh, there is life here. Okay. <laughs> well, yes. Thank you again. Thank you for sharing your amazing story. And we know you will continue to thrive as you go on and represent and be the the um the inspiration and representation for another young black girl, another young girl, another young child with a disability who didn't see anybody growing up. You will be that person for them and we appreciate you for that. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna um, shift gears and now give space for Tamika to be able to present and share her story. Okay, let me share my screen. Candice, thank you for serving that up to us today. <laughs> that was really, really good. Okay, let's see here. Um, hmm. Okay. All right. So thank you again for having me. Uh, my name is Tamika Lewis. I'm the clinical director and founder of Walk Therapy Women of Color Therapy. Um, I am a mother of two beautiful kids. I identify as uh, a Black woman, although my parents are of Black and Persian ancestry. Uh, I am also, uh, I'm a product of a single mother, and I'm also a, a single mother myself. And I'm from the San Fernando Valley. I live out here, which was uh, originally occupied by the Tatavian uh, Band of Indians. Um, and I went to Cal State Long Beach for graduate school, um, for school counseling. And then I went to UCLA. Um, I, I decided at, at Long Beach that I wanted to do a lot more clinical work. So I went right into the program at UCLA and studied um, social work. And right out of UCLA, um, I went into uh, uh, working for DCFS. So that's the Department of Child Welfare Services. Uh, we were kind of talking about this earlier. It, it was a very challenging workspace, um, just encountering all the structural barriers and all the limited resources uh, that were available to you. I just found it to be really, really challenging. And our role was to help protect children, but also to reunify families wherever possible. And it just felt sometimes like an uphill battle. It's just kind of a broken system. So I decided that I, I wanted to, I needed to leave that space and I went into back into education. And so I worked for LUSD as a school counselor for, for many, many years, and then went into private practice, which I'll share a little bit about. I consider myself to be a healer, an advocate, um, and also like Candace, I love to travel. In the last couple of years, I've been able to visit Thailand and Peru. And I took, uh, we took a kid-free, a mama's only trip to the Maldives, which was legendary. <laughs> so, um, so yes, that is my jam, travel. Uh, so I wanted to, I thought I would just share with you all some critical points in my career journey. And one of them was in 2015, I was working full time as a school counselor um, for Poly High School. And I'd started to see a few clients on the side. And I rented an office um, out of this, that it was a bigger office suite. And there were eight clinicians in this office suite, and they were all white and older. And um, the one thing, though, about the difference was I was going into building this practice with a lot of, I had taken some online business courses. I had been reading books on entrepreneurship. I had been networking with other female entrepreneurs. So I came in to my work uh, as a therapist with a, a different mindset. So while I was kind of the rookie in the office. I actually had higher rates. My rates were higher 
than all of the other clinicians in that office because I understood that the, the value that I was bringing um, and I was really committed to over delivering and providing just excellent client support and client services. And I also was able to identify a niche, which then started to grow. Um, and by 2018, I was presented with, um, with a choice that I had to make. And I want to make sure that I go back to 2015, because in each of these years, there was an important lesson. So the lesson for me for 2015 was really to know my worth. Um, and it's really important to know the value that you bring. Um, I really had to stop and think about all the, the years of education, the hours that I clocked of, you know, just training and experience and, and really trust that what I was bringing into that space um, was really, really valuable. So, so knowing your, your worth, and this also eliminates competition and it also um, eliminates imposter syndrome too, because you know what you're bringing. So 2018, now my practice is, is growing to a point where I have to decide if I'm going to keep my full-time job at, at Poly as a school counselor, or if I'm going to leave and step into the world of private practice. And this was really scary for me because uh, I, I was a single mom of two, um, you know, working for a district, you have very secure benefits, you got that secure um, paycheck. And I was just like, thinking, oh, my God, like, am I really going to do this? Um, and I think a game changer for me was I had, again, I had women in my life, had other um, entrepreneurs, also moms in my life who were challenging me to, um, to play bigger. And it constantly, like, for example, I had a friend who, whenever I was thinking and worrying about health insurance, she would always talk to me about, you need to factor that expense into your profit model. So it's not an issue. You know, it's not going to be an issue because you're just going to make the money that you need to be able to afford the insurance. And so this was like a real shift for me, just even kind of stepping into this abundance mindset that, you know, that everything was going to work out, that I was going to be taken care of. And um, it was just really scary, but I knew that the, the bigger desire that I had for more autonomy in my life, I wanted more autonomy. I wanted to, um, I really wanted to be my own boss and I, and I really wanted more rest and recreation in my life. And I, and I really want to point that out because as black women, you know, I grew up with, with a single mother who worked. 13 plus hour day. So I didn't really have a model of, of someone who I felt that she really got to do what she loved. I felt like it was more, you know, an, an issue of kind of survival. And that's the, the, these are the spaces that we often grow up in. And so I just wanted to challenge that. I wanted to bet on myself. And so I took the leap and um, I left. And um, the lesson for 2018 was just trusting your intuition. You got to trust your body wisdom when it's telling you to take a leap and just know that, um, and have faith and know that it's, it's going to be right for you. So then 2019 comes and the year before Armageddon, it fell with COVID and then everything with George Floyd. I mean, it was just, a, you know, crazy couple of years. Um, but I found out in 2019 that I was one of only two therapists of color, black therapists on the Kaiser panel for the entire Valley. And that women were waiting uh, up to one month to be able to see a therapist of color. And I thought this is really not okay. And so I decided to shift my solo practice to becoming uh, a group practice. And then we kind of we became incorporated um, so we were officially, um, walk therapy and I hired our first therapist. So there were two of us and, and the, over the next couple of years, we grew from two therapists to now we're a team of nine. Um, and the other cool thing that happened is, uh, I moved out of that one office that, that I was renting into, um, my own suite. 
and it was it was next door to the suite with all the other the the eight clinicians that I originally worked with and so it was just such a good feeling you know um to to be able to experience that come up like right next to where it all started because to be honest with you there were many times in that suite where I felt a uh, little I felt you know dismissed like people were kind of like trying to figure me out um and it just wasn't always a very welcoming space um, so I just was so proud for us to have been able to, to, uh, grow and have our own space with our own name out on the, on the, the name plate. Um, and the lesson for 2019 was really start before you're ready. I wasn't really ready to grow at that level. Like, I mean, we had just started, but we were getting calls left and right. And I had to make a choice. Am I going to just like build this wait list? Or am I going to keep hiring and just keep growing and keep meeting the demand? And things were not perfect. I think like Candace, I was in grind mode in this time. So there really wasn't a lot of work-life balance because I knew I was like in startup mode. I knew I had to learn and tighten up systems and figure out a lot of stuff. But I just, I wanted to just take action, even though it was, it was imperfect action. I wanted to just keep moving forward. So I think that's another kind of um, offering is just, it's not always going to be perfect, but you just got to keep moving forward. And it's really those tiny steps, um, kind of like the book that I'm working on, it's those tiny courageous steps that actually lead you towards um, success. So now we are in 2023 and um, this is, this feels like a scary year for me, uh, just again, kind of like back in, in 2015, because now we're about to move out of the offices into a home. We are, I'm currently pitching and raising funding, um, to secure a home that will become the walk wellness center. And this feels like a really big shift, but I also feel like we know in our bodies when it's time to kind of up level and, and grow and expand. And that's what this year really feels like. And so, but it is requiring me to, um, you know, put myself out there in ways that I'm, that I'm not used to. Um, but I think this is, it's just really important to be able to do that. So uh, inspirational leadership is kind of, I think the lesson for this year, which is about being out there training more rising clinicians, um, developing our programs and just really leading. I think that's what the, the theme for this year is about. I wanted to share a deeper why behind walk therapy. Um, I, I had two very dear friends, uh, college mates who both died by suicide. And um, one of them was Jennifer here in the green shirt. And this really shook me. I really, this happened back in 2009. Um, so that was, this was the second friend that I lost. And one of the things that I just, I really was curious about is just that disconnect between how we as women of color present to the world and, and what was really going on inside. And so I just wanted to, to really research and understand this. And I did, um, the research confirms that we, um, you know, a large portion of women of color are struggling with major depression and it's going undiagnosed because we're not really talking to anybody. Um, and a lot large part of that is just, you know, stigma. I think we are finally kind of coming to terms with mental health and, and being brave and like, and, you know, seeking help. But um, the other factor is, is really also lack of of care providers that really get us, that really, you know, understand our experiences. So these are some of the issues that women come in to us with. Women have rage. I feel like rage as women of color is our birthright because, you know, as well as joy, but um, that rage is, is, is founded, you know, there's justification for it. Um, anxiety, women are feeling, um, depressed, they are dealing with codependency, they are struggling with issues and the microaggressions in the workplace. Um, and we work with really dynamic 
um, women who want to do good things in this world, but it, it feels like there's no place for them. And so, you know, at work or even in relationships, you know, a lot of the people we're working with are trying to find love and it just feels like an impossible, an impossible um, uphill kind of battle at times. And so the, like I said, the main issue is really a lot of times they're not talking because there's no one that really understands um, their unique experiences and can validate those. And so I know some of y'all might know this, this movie Get Out um, and it's a funny kind of reference, but it actually is very real. Um, I had my own experiences with white therapists um, and I'm not, and I think there are some really wonderful white therapists out there, but um, my experience very much confirmed the feeling of where, you know, I was in a position where I was having to educate and, and, you know, um, teach her things that, you know, I just, I really wanted help. And so uh, this is what a lot of our women share that they experience. And so um, that's why it's so important for us to have safe spaces for, for us as women of color to be able to come and, um, and get help. So the difference in working with a culturally competent provider is that we are asking different questions. So I love this quote by Gail Parker. It says, race-based trauma is an injury, not a pathology. And so we're not asking what's wrong with you. We're, we're, we want to know what happened, what happened to you, and what are the, the, um, the systemic and historical occurrences that happened to you that, that have led to you um, battling with depression or battling with low self-esteem. Um, we also want to know where this is, you know, showing up in your body. Where do you feel this in your body and how can you find more self-love and, and rest in your day, which is something as women of color that we are not privy to a lot of times, you know, being able to stop and rest and play. So we want to be able to bring that back into our communities um, and really look at at the tools and beliefs, wisdoms that are already inherent in our, our traditions and our culture. So this is my um, team and I'm just so excited and proud of, of just who all these women are. We all come from very different cultural backgrounds. We all have very different skill sets, but um, this is just amazing to see. And we actually just hired another therapist and we're bringing on more interns. So um, the, the, this is very reflective that there's a, there's a continued need and we're just gonna keep showing up to, to really meet that need. And one thing I wanna share about just, you know, as I look at this picture, I always wanted my work in life to feel like play. And this very much, like, I don't feel like what I do is work because, you know, I work with this amazing team of women and the clients we work with um, are amazing. So I just, I feel like it is just a dream, truly, to wake up and be able to do this every day. And so these are some of the, the services that we offer. We, um, I, I want to share that I think in whatever profession you go into, it's really important to stay ahead of the trends and the pra and best practices for that discipline. And so as therapists, we're constantly asking, okay, what, what's working and what's not working? Like, what do we need to improve? Um, what are the people, what do the people want? You know, really starting where the client's at. And what we are, are understanding and what re research is showing is that talk therapy alone is not as effective um, without pairing it with some of these other tools. So energy healing, making sure that you're, you're, um, you're healing the body, that there's some kind of interaction with the body is really important. So that's why we, we provide Reiki and chakra healing and energy healing. Um, and then community, sisterhood. Um, this is something that, again, is native to our own cultures where we, we come together in community, we help and we connect. And that's what we, we seek to provide as well as sisterhood and, uh, and community. And then we're also exploring the role of, um, of plant medicines and just different alternative forms of healing um, that are proving to be effective in treating depression and some of these other 
treatment resistant um, disorders. And so just keeping an open mind and just, you know, staying honest about um, in your profession about and ahead of uh, of the things that um, maybe you need to like, just be quick to, to change, change course and, and make sure that you're, you're creating things that are relevant and helpful to your community. I think it's important. I wanted to share this because in anything that we do, I'm learning that you want to have a way to measure your growth. You know, data and numbers are really important. And I never really liked looking at numbers. Um, I just wanted to talk to people but especially now, as I'm trying to ask and, and raise this money, people are asking me hard questions and I needed to come back to some really hard data. Um, and I just think in general, it's important for you to have your own metric. Like people are going to offer up all kinds of criteria for you, you know, to follow. But what is your own criteria to know that you are growing um, and that you're being effective in the in the work that you do, whether that's in, in your professional or personal life? How do you know you're being effective? And so um, it was really amazing to, to get the pull the numbers together and to see exactly how many client sessions we we had in, in 2022 and what are the percentages of our growth and looking at our client retention and and really being able to see the that the work that we're doing is working um and the other thing is, that's important is to know your your unique proposition like to to know your competitive edge what is it that is unique about you and your personal experiences, your skill set that nobody else in the world has that you're bringing to the table, that alone eliminates, because um, I, 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 I think it's important to talk about competition because I think one of the things that trips us up is we are looking at other people and what they're doing and how quickly they're doing it. And it just, we don't stay in our lane. And you got to really stay in your lane and know what it is that you bring and trust that 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 voice and that message is is unique and desired and it needs to you need to get it out there at all costs. So just knowing uh, knowing your competitive edge. And um, and then I think that's kind of I think that's all I don't want to like go too long, but. Um, I do want to, to offer up, we do have a, a self-care guide that you can download on our website. This is um, a 50 plus page book with journal prompts and exercises and all sorts of things that you could um, use to um, just build self-care into your weekly routine, um, and which I think as women of color, that's something that we really like to prioritize and emphasize. Um, yeah, and here's our contact information. Thank you so much, Tamika. Um, I think that was such a great presentation and being able to share just also not just your personal experience and the lessons that we have in life that you're able to carry out and you were sharing with us, which is incredible advice, um, but also kind of like a blueprint for anybody interested in opening up their own business, I think. <laughs> um, and also, I think just one of the things that stood out to me too is the passion that you have. Like some people, you know, like they were born to be placed into like these certain careers and these certain paths and like you and Candice, like I can see both of you being exactly where you need to be. And that's pretty amazing to, to share with our GCC community. Um, I'm wondering if anybody in the chat has any questions um, for Tamika um, or Candice. We have five more minutes left um, of our time together. And so I'm wondering if there are any questions. Hey, yeah, I, yeah, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so, uh... And we see now it's I unfortunately it seems like we're like regressing back in time with like women's rights. And then we see in some states like Florida, like banning books because of CRT. Uh, how do you think uh, that how is that going to impact the uh, like women of color in those certain states? And how how do you what would you recommend to them to do to like, you know, not to deal with the repercussions of those actions. Yeah. 
I think um, it's really important to plug into, I'm going to stop sharing this, um, to plug into networks. Um, so for example, someone that I'm, I'm connected to out here works with the Women's Democracy Lab. And uh, I think it's important to find point persons in each of these states um, so that we can band together and pull resources. Um, I, I'm very aware that we enjoy a lot more progressive type thinking and um, resources and support out here. And but we certainly even our team get on the phone with people that live in other states with other women and we are cross referencing and cross breeding ideas and ways that we can support one another. So I, I think um, um, finding a network and finding um, thinking outside of the box as far as that as well is really, really important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Candace, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, um, I mean, Tamika had summed it up beautifully, but I would definitely say um, one thing I've learned um, as I was pursuing my educational journey, you have to seek out what you want to know. And um, so I've learned just within journalism and my own inquisitive mind, if you want to find out the truth, if you want to seek out something that like in different states is being banned or whatever the case may be, if you're looking to educate yourself more on different policies and things like that, the general news, the general public is not going to give it to you. They're going to actually take away from you as you're seeing. But um, I think if you constantly pursue it you have to constantly pursue the history and the information you want um just even with myself and black history i didn't learn true black history until i went to college and started taking courses that were dedicated to that so i think when you are seeking information or want more information on something constantly seeking out more of that um, and just being steadfast with that because education is knowledge knowledge is power and then connecting like Tamika said to your resources your community you put those together you got action Candace that makes me think of someone once said to me there are two sets of notes you need to take as a student the notes to pass the test and the notes to know the truth so you're, it's a parallel um, uh, exploration. Definitely. I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ladies, again for your time. Um, before we go, I had a question for Tamika. Where do you see Walk in five years? Um, I see us possibly launching our second Walk house. So once we get this initial Walk, um, this Walk house down, the hope is to to have them everywhere. That's kind of what we want to do. Yes, let me see you walk. I know <laughs> you get it. Um, Alexandra Evans has a question. Hi, everyone. This is so wonderful and motivating. So thank you for being a part of the panelists, both of you. Um, I have a question about mentorship. Did you all have any professional mentors um, to help guide you along the way or help you with being motivated? Or was it just a personal motivation to, to thrive? Yeah, that's a really, really key part of this is very early on, I started uh, meeting with a, a friend who now, um, she was one of those like earlier moms who's also an entrepreneur and we would get on the phone once a week and mastermind and just talk about ideas that we had. Um, it was very focused and we held each other accountable. And from that is where uh, I learned about some of these other online communities uh, that I plugged into. And so once you steep yourself in a certain energy and language, it starts to normalize uh, choices that you start, that you make that seem outlandish to like some people, but it it's very sensible, you know, based on like who the circles that you're running into. And so even today I have um, accountability partners and people that I am speaking to at least monthly um, about goals. 
Um, for myself, I'll be brief. Um, I say definitely in the beginning, it was all self-motivation. I was like, I don't want to work for anyone else anymore. I really want to represent for my community, myself. Um, but now I definitely would say that I have accountability partners, thought partners, um, I do have one mentor. I don't even think she knows that she's my mentor, but she is. Um, I talk to her pretty much on a weekly basis and she is in similar work and just the ability to, like Tamika said, you know, bounce ideas off of each other, talk about things, see the trajectory of where you want things to be. That's an invaluable um, piece of the of your career and your your current place. So um, I definitely am more appreciative of the mentorship now. And now I want to be that mentor for a mentee. I want to be able to provide that knowledge and that lived experience to the next individual. I got to say bar none, this is one of the best um, things I've experienced here as a student at GCC. And I want to give a shout out to my mentor slash counselor, Alexandra, who just asked the question. Um, yeah, we need each other. We, we got to have each other's back. And males, we need allies. So yeah, please speak up for us and let us know we have your support out loud, not just when it's convenient for you. <laughs> no offense. Um, anyway, uh, Carla, I will let you wrap up again. Thank you, Tamika and Candice. I tapped in. I'm fans. I followed on everything. So yeah. <laughs> thank you thank you so much billy thank you everyone thank you to mika and candace for being here today for our event for billy for doing an amazing job facilitating our event for today um i'm going to drop in the chat uh i dropped in to mika and candace's emails if y'all want to connect with them a mentorship you know anything you, you want i know they're open to it um and then i'm also going to attach a link to our other women history month event we have one starting tomorrow as well as we continue the celebration so thank you all for being here today Bye, everyone. Thank you so much, Carla. Bye, Bye everyone. Have a great rest of the week. Thank you. You too. Bye. Thank you, Robbie. <laughs> Have a good one. <laughs>